assalamu alaikum i welcome you all in the online certificate course on basic cell culture technique which is organized by comstec secretariat in collaboration with iccbs and tubingen university germany i would request kari bilal for the recitation of holy quran أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أفلا ينظرون إلى الإبل كيف خلقت وإلى السماء وإلى الجبال كيف نصبت وإلى الأرض كيف سطحت فذكر إنما أنت مذكر لست عليهم بمصيطر إلا من تولى وكفر فيعذبه الله العذاب الأكبر إن إلينا إيابه إن علينا حسابه صدق الله العظيم In this online certificate course we have participants uh, more than 400 all over the Muslim countries Now I would request uh, Professor Dr. Amit Bal Chaudhary, our teacher, mentor, and uh, CT of Comstec, uh, for the welcome address. Aaj bilal hi mere shayad mein jee. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Very good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Different time zone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am absolutely delighted to welcome you. to another very important workshop aiming to improve the capacity in the field of cell culturing uh, this is a, a series of events in the midst of uh, covid-19 when physical mobility is not possible it is important to continue uh, our activities and continue to Uh, help each other in developing capacity international cooperation and other important facet of science and technology and innovation comstec uh, in collaboration with international center for chemical and biological sciences is uh, organizing yet a very important event uh, the previous events uh, were focusing were focused on virology and other very important aspect of uh, healthcare so this is an extremely important uh, workshop which i'm sure you would benefit if you spend time and interact with the resource persons which we have from uh, germany and from pakistan uh, we have resource persons from one of the top universities of germany uh, tubingen university uh dr professor dr subla sheikh farooq and uh, professor dr alex and both of them are very well known in this discipline they already are practitioners of the use of uh, cell culturing and they have been publishing a lot in using cell culturing as one of the tools of important uh, nature uh i am grateful to my team in international center for chemical and biological sciences led by professor dr dr atit wahab and uh, also my team in comstec for organizing it and fortunately khazima is not feeling well we wish her uh, 
quick and speedy recovery from whatever illness she has. And uh, I would request you to kindly make sure that you interact with the resource persons because what you would learn is something which you would uh, use in your research. And hopefully followed by these events sometime in near future, we would be able to invite you to one of the centers of uh, Comstack uh, in different countries and uh, uh, and to provide you hands-on training. But till then, whatever the means available, we should benefit from that. Cell culturing, we all understand, is used in every discipline of biomedical, biochemical, and medical sciences. It is a tool of a general utility and importance. Uh, people who know how to culture cells are the one who would be able to do research very effectively. Uh, it is uh, one of the most essential skills which uh, you need to have as a scientist in the field of biomedical, biochemical, and medical sciences. And that is the reason why we emphasize on it. Uh, uh, all the Comstock events are targeted towards uh, technologies, enabling technologies which are required for conducting research. So, uh, Enjoy the event and benefit from uh, excellent presentations, discussions, and whatever the hands-on training. Of course, hands and training would largely be confined to your own space. But certainly, if you interact, you would be able to learn a lot more than uh, uh, you uh, can do it by reading books. With this, I would like to welcome you all to this workshop and wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I would request a resource person, Dr. Sumla Paul, to start the session. Thank you, uh, Dr. Atiya. It's an honor for me to um, be a part of uh, this uh, workshop and to help people learn, students and scientists learn new techniques and things that uh, now, which have become a, a very important part of uh, research, drug designing and uh, studying drug metabolism and everything. So I'll start with my presentation now. Please go ahead. Thank you, sir. The topic of my lecture today is Introduction to Mammalian, Mammalian Cell Culture, Basic Principles and Techniques. We will be covering in this uh, presentation, introduction, how it all started, historical background, types of cell culture, basic equipments and facilities in animal cell culture, media and its composition, applications of cell culture techniques. First of all, introduction. Basically, what does cell culture mean to you people? Cell culture is basically, or earlier it used to be called as tissue culture, but now we, we have really a specific term cell culture for that, to culture cells. Cell culture or tissue culture of cells is a technique that is um, culturing and growing up cells in vitro, in petri dishes, in, in flasks, um, in four well, eight well, 16 wet plates. And this technique, technique is used in many areas of science, especially drug development. Now we get back to the history of cell culture. How do we basically um, specify cell culture? Why, why do we say cell culture or tissue culture? The, the most common characteristic or the, the, the characteristic that defines multicellular organisms is this, that as the name suggests, they are multicellular. Each organ, is composed of a specific type of cells 
these cells have a specific structure, specific function, and they are differentiated from the day they start growing. An organism starts growing. They start to define themselves and differentiate themselves. Every cell type in any individual organ has a very specific function such as secrete enzymes, compounds, or send electrical impulses like the neural cells. So how can we really study a multicellular organism all together by targeting certain organs or certain, um, certain functions? We can't really study in a multicellular in a multi multicellular organism all these all together in one being. So what do we do? Over the years, over decades, the scientists developed techniques of in vitro cultivation of cells, which now has evolved into cell culturing. During the late nineteenth and twentieth century. What the scientists used to do was this, that they used to preserve the tissue function after the death of the organism. For example, if, an, uh, if, uh, if a multicellular organism or if, um, they died, then the scientists wanted to use to extract organs and then they used to study how that specific organ or those cells function. And it was the beginning of the uh, cell culture or tissue culture techniques. Rue, uh, in 1885, he um, grew chicken embryo tissue in saline solution, which was, he was quite successful. There were a lot of problems, but he was quite successful. And then afterwards, Jolly, in 1903, he um, grew salamander leukocytes. And as these techniques developed, as the interest of scientists developed to study the cellular mechanism of different organs or different uh, uh, animals, they uh, started working more on it. And then uh, Harrison in 1907, he grew a frog embryo tissue in a hanging drop setup. Here on my slide, you can see the image of um, hanging drop setup. You can see that there is this uh, cover slip and there is the, the tissue is attached to the cover slip and the cover slip is placed inside uh, like a deep slide and then it grew in it and it was covered with wax materials so that uh, outside contaminations might not go inside. Then um, Burroughs in 1910, he also uh, successfully managed to do a long-term cultivation of chicken embryo cells, which um, further resulted in the first artificial cell culture medium. Lewis and Lewis in 1911 tried to grow cells in seawater, serum, embryo extract, salts, and peptones. And we can say that they were the pioneers of cell culture media. Then in early 20th century, scientists kept on, kept on investigating, kept on trying to figure out how to successfully grow, but in the end, eventually either there were problems with the medium, either there were problems with the tissues, the gro not growing, the cells not growing into a particular medium or contamination, a very, very big problem, bacterial contamination. Carol, in 1913, he introduced strict aseptic techniques and he said that he, um, he, I, there is an image of this flask. He designed a T-shell 
tea flask as a cell culture whisk. And you know, till two days, we use these tea flasks. But of course, the shape has evolved and the capacity has evolved and the function has evolved and developed a lot. But he was the pioneer of these tea culture, uh, tea flasks, uh, cell culture vessels. Then from tissue culture to cell culture, Bro and Jones in 1916, he, they introduced the proteolytic enzyme trypsin to free cells from the tissue matrix. Now, earlier, all these uh, scientists that I have mentioned earlier, from Root to Carroll, they all um, tried to grow tissues. They tried to develop in vitro tissue culture. But Roe and Johns, they figured out that these cells do not grow properly and there are many problems. So they, because of their adherent characteristics and their matrix that adheres them to each other and forms lumps. So what they tried to do was, and what they um, figured out that trypsin, the process we call it trypsinization of the cells. And then trypsin is a proteolytic enzyme that uh, dissolves the cell matrix, tissue matrix, and then frees the cells or uh, it cuts off or it breaks the clumps, the cell clumps, so that the cells can no longer, they are no longer in tissue state, but then they clump up, uh, they form a monolayer. In the mid 20th century, there were uh, many advancement occurs, occurred and gay in 1933, he, invented roller tubes. You can see in this image that I have on my presentation, there are, these are like tubes, like centrifuge tubes and uh, cells are grown into these tubes. And you know, the uh, for the home, uh, homogeneous uh, layer or to form a mono layer of the cells, they were, um, you know, they, were, um, they could be moved or they, they could be rotated and they could be rolled. Um, then later on in 1940s, antibiotics, penicillin and streptomycin were uh, discovered and they were like, they were, they were used for cell culture because the most common contamination in the cell culture and tissue culture techniques was um, bacterial contamination. So how to avoid that? The scientists have evolved or, you know, formulated culture medias, they, they formulated aseptic techniques, but still bacterial contamination was a big problem. It was, it was a major problem because at the end of the day, with the bacterial contamination, you really cannot conduct any experiments and you will never get the right results. So the scientists thought that, okay, if we add some uh, antibiotics uh, to the culture media, then of course the efficiency of the culture media and the growth of the cells would be more aseptic, better without bacterial contamination. Afterwards, when slowly and gradually all these techniques advanced, all these, um, the development of medium, the development of antibiotics, addition of certain things, um, certain additives to the medium um, led to a very, very successful development or led to a very successful um, formulation of this uh, technique. Then, then came the question of how to, have special cell lines, you know, because um, every disease is mostly, for example, if we are studying cancer studies or we are studying oncology or if we are designing drugs for uh, uh, cancer, then what do we do? We, we have to have a specific, uh, like say, for example, it's, uh, we have lung cancer, we have breast cancer, we have prostate cancer. So what do we do? We cannot study lung cancer 
on breast cancer cells. And we, of course, cannot study any neurodegenerative disease on any other organ of the body because it won't be productive. We will not really know the results. So the scientists gradually designed and defined cell lines. Earl, he um, managed to grow in 1948 mouse fibroblasts, then gay in 1952 started, or um, he uh, grew HeLa cervix carcinoma, HeLa cells, which are till to date being used uh, for the for cervix carcinoma and other uh, as a control for many cancer uh, experiments or many drug tests. So uh, this was gradually, you know, the division of or specification of the cell lines that specific cell lines for specific drugs, specific diseases. Then um, Ham. He, in 1965, um, because earlier, you know, always the scientists thought that only um, uh, cells could be grown or tissues could be grown in serum, which of course, not, till to date, we are using serum. But in 1965, Ham said that maybe we, we can grow cells without uh, medium. And then he, Sato in 1978, he added a lot of growth factors and hormones uh, to the cells, uh, to the cell uh, culture med medium. So this was a brief history of uh, how the cell culture techniques evolved and how um, the scientists discovered to use these techniques, to develop these techniques, then comes the equipment and materials for this technique that we are using now, till to date. First of all, the most important thing is sterile work area. Sterile work area is very important because the cell culture uh, methods or in vitro growing of cells is a very sensitive technique. It definitely needs aseptic uh, techniques and the Cells should be separated from all the all the possible contaminations. Separate incubators, separate workbench, separate rooms, which nowadays is a must. You cannot have cell culture in a regular lab. And then for the primary cell cultures, we have to be even more careful because they also contain microorganisms from the organs, they, from the animals they have been extracted and we have to be very careful in particular. Then comes um, the protection of the scientists. There is sterile work area, then the scientists should have to be protected and the cells should also be protected from the scientists, not the scientists, only from the cells because we ourselves are also a carrier of a lot of microorganisms, bacteria, viruses around us. So we also have to be careful while dealing the cells. So lab coats, latex gloves, masks, and then to further enhance the sterility of the work area, we need UV lamps, 70% ethanol, or any disinfectant which is specially designed and formulated for the purpose of uh, disinfecting cell culture areas, hands and work surfaces. Ideal conditions for the cell culture. Now we are talking about ideal conditions. Ideal conditions mean that probably nowadays it's a must. We, we can't say that I can have a cell culture of a laminar flow wood inside my chemical lab or synthesis lab. It's not possible. It has to be a security level two lab because um, you have to have special air flows. You have to have special, um, you cannot open the windows. You have to have um, filters and um, so it's, it's very important. Ideal conditions means that these conditions actually are needed, are required. These are uh, separate rooms uh, containing incubators, workbench, microscope, and actually for cell culture purposes, 
they have to be inside these separate rooms where the cell culture is growing so that they cannot be contaminated with outside air, people, or any other work. Lab coats, gloves, masks, regular disinfection of the area, minimal conditions, okay. Well, nowadays these minimal conditions don't exist because we all have special labs and, uh, um, but you know, okay, if, if you don't have a special lab and you really want to do this work, then in disinfected clean area, Bunsen, bur uh, Bunsen bur burner. Uh, these burners, you know, normal regular uh, burners in the chemistry lab, but they, they create um, sterile bubbles so that the outside microorganisms and things cannot enter the laminar fluid. But I personally would think that um, it's um, too obsolete now. Nobody uses a Bunsen burner, even in Europe. Uh, right here, we are not even, we don't even have gas connections in the labs now in the flow hoods for safety purposes. So we have to do without this. Now, there, this is an image of a, a sterile work area and you can see this is a laminar flow hood. It's all closed and uh, while working, you can open the, uh, you can push up the um, lid and work, but you uh, normally with the flow hoods, they always tell automatically till what, um, um, how much we have to open it. You know, we really can't open it full all up and then start working. It's not possible. It will scream like hell and it will give the alarm that no, it's not sterile. And how does the um, air, um, the function of these um, sterile work hood, um, these laminar flow hoods, they, they are performed. Now we have these filters on the top and the air comes from outside and it is filtered through these filters and then it enters the flow hood, the bench. Now, when it enters it, it this is all filtered air which, which enters the laminar flow hood. And when it enters, then it leaves out, but because of the air pressure and uh, blowing of the air, it is not possible for the outside air to enter the flow hood. So this makes a sterile atmosphere for the, um, for the cell culture. So this is basic principle with the laminar flow hood. And for the burner, Bunsen burner, which I told you earlier, how to have a sterile area. It's like when we uh, turn on the burner, the warm air, which is sterilized, it flows upwards and because of the convection current, current uh, since there is no, uh, when the warm air is warm, it goes up and then there is like a vacuum created underneath. And then the air from the warm air from the top of the burner comes down with a convection current and then creates a bubble, a sterile bubble for the uh, cell culture techniques. But, Um, this is a small video I have to show you for the, of the cell culture of the cell culture facility at ICCBS, and uh, I, I'll now start the video, and we can discuss it afterwards. Meeting password, meeting ID, I give. Usko click karega, password aega, password click karna ho jaye. Abhi pehle ke com search karke jaye. Com search karke kuch nahi jaana, sir zoom download kar le. Zoom to kar liya, kar liya na, bas join kar do usme. Dr. Sundar, you cannot hear the sound. I think you uh, forgot to check the mic, actually, the voice. 
Let me see. You can't hear me? No, uh, we can hear you, but uh, we cannot hear the sound of the video. Okay, let me see then. Now, can you hear me? Uh, hear the video? No, we cannot see the video and we cannot hear the video. Oh, okay. One minute, please. Let me see. I think there is some. Um... Now the video is back? No, not yet. Let's see if you can hear. Uh, can you please share your screen again? Okay. We cannot hear the sound voice of the video, but we can see the video now. Okay, then let me see. You need to check on, yeah. Yeah, one minute, let me see. Actually, what I did was I... I incorporated the video to avoid complication into the PowerPoint, but I think it's not working. So I'll run the video separately then. Yeah. yeah. I'll get back to the... New share. <clears throat> Where was the box actually? I can't find that box. Now, can you hear? We can hear you. Yeah, share computer sound. When you share, then there is a box uh, where share computer sound. Then you can share. One, one minute, one minute. Uh, give me a minute. The, when you the, see the, share, share screen, then you can see actually. Yeah, I, but I do, I can't see this time. I don't understand why. Just a minute. Give me a minute. Let's do it this way then. Facility at the International Center for Chemical and... Now is it okay? Yes. And biological sciences comprises of two BSL level 2 labs with six isolated units. Each unit is equipped with a biosafety cabinet, a microscope with a screen, a centrifuge machine and a carbon dioxide incubator. An appropriate set of dedicated PPEs is worn before entering the unit for work.
So as you saw, now can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay. Now, as you saw the video, all these equipment, microscopes, incubators, laminar flow put are an essential part of the cell culture lab. Let's talk about these things one by one. Incubator. Incubators maintain cells at a temperature of 37 degrees because we all know that a mammalian cell temperature, uh, body temperature, optimal body temperature is 37 degrees. So in order to facilitate the growth of cells and provide a very, very optimal atmosphere temperature to the cells, the incubators are designed to have 37 degrees temp uh, 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 to be uh, stable at 37 degrees uh, centigrade. Then CO2 is uh, carbon dioxide is uh, required for the medium. So uh, um, a supply of CO2 also has to be connected to the uh, incubators. And normally we have uh, all the incubators uh, for normal mammalian cells, the in, uh, carbon dioxide concentration is 5%, 95% air and 5% carbon dioxide. Air humidity has to be 95%. Why? This is a very important question. Why do we always um, add sterile water to the incubators? You know, at the, at the bottom of the incubators, we always add a specific amount of water. Why do we do that? Because we do not want the cells to dry. Because at one point, uh, because of 37 degrees temperature and, um, and a closed atmosphere, the, the cells and the media, uh, the medium will at one point dry and the cells will also dry. So they will not grow, they will die. So we have to have a humid, um, we have to have humid air in order to have this um, balance. Temperature cannot be too low because at low temperatures, the growth is inhibited. Temperature cannot be too high because of course it will kill the cells. We have to. Um, we also have to keep in uh, keep in mind that the incubators have to be regularly sterilized. Normally, we have um, UV lights that we put inside the incubator and connect it to the outside external source, and then um, overnight these UV lights um, uh, are are lit inside the incubators, and so they kill all the microorganisms or any other things that are present. And then, of course, uh, cleaning them with the disinfectants and maintaining um, uh, the sterility level is very important. And we have to regularly do that. There are different types of incubators. In this um, image, you can see we have this uh, the, uh, the, the incubator for flasks where we can grow T cells or suspension cultures. And then we have the normal regular incubator where we have flasks and uh, petri dishes or slides which we grow. The, the first incubator that I showed for the flasks, you know, it um, because it's meant for the suspension cultures. So it has um, moving, uh, it, it rotates also and it uh, shakes also. So it's like a shaker as well. Then comes the refrigeration and freezing of the cells. Now at four degrees, uh, all the media and all the solutions that are required for the cell culture have to be stored at four degrees centigrade because otherwise, um, you know, the, they are designed to grow things. And so if we will have optimal temperature, 37 degrees, 25 degrees or, or certain temperatures or like room temperatures and we leave it there for long, then we will have contaminations in it. We will have bacteria growing in it. So all the medium and solutions, they have to be stored at four degrees centigrade. Then minus 20 degrees for the freeze, uh, minus 20 degree freezer is a must to store serum, nutrients, antibiotics for long-term long -term basis. Then for the freezing of cells and storage of cells, a minus 80 degree freezer is also needed. And then um, in a minus 80 degree freezer, we can store cells up to um, three months. And if you want to store cells for 
longer period for years, then we definitely need liquid nitrogen for that. So these things are very important to maintain a, a, very, a good, effective cell culture practice. Then we need the microscopes. Microscope uh, for a cell culture lab, we, we can have a simple inverted light, light microscope. We do not need a fluorescent microscope or a confocal laser scanning microscope. Basically for everyday cell culture routine, we need a, a simple inverted light microscope with 10 and 20, ob, uh, 20 time objectives. We have to regularly observe the cell, observe the cells in, um, under the microscope whenever we I have tryptonized them whenever we are looking at them, whenever we are planning to culture them, whenever we are planning to um, use them for experiments. We definitely always, always keep this in mind. Never ever um, start anything with the cells without first having a look at them in the microscope because you don't see what's going on in the cells with the naked eye and you really have to see with a microscope if the morphology of the cells is right, if they're growing okay, if they do not have any contamination, because there are certain contaminations like bacterial contamination, you can see really under the microscope, a regular microscope, you can see. Because um, my colleague tomorrow, he'll give you a lecture about contamination and he'll really show small bacteria floating around in a contaminated cell culture. So, this is a, a very, very important part, having a microscope in the cell culture lab. Um, normally, you know, these, the Erlmeyer flasks that I showed you for cell culture, for suspension cell cultures, okay, we really cannot observe those cells um, during, uh, because we cannot observe the, the cells in these suspension cultures, but the routine cell culture in which the, the T flask or petri dishes or four well dishes or eight well dishes, um, we can really um, observe the stars, uh, cells if efficiently and effectively, and we can really pinpoint how they're growing, how is their morphology, and if there is any contamination or not. Then 40 times and 100 time objectives are important for the hemocytometer. Hemocytometer we'll study um, later on during this lecture. What is it used for and um, what's the purpose? But we can uh, manage with the 20 times objective also, although with a bit difficulty, we'll have to be very careful. We won't be really like um, clearly seeing the cells, but you can work with a 20 time objective also for the hemocytometer. Hemocytometer is basically used for cell counting, but preferably, if possible, we should try to have, uh, have a 40X or 100X objective for the hemocytometer. Then the, in the equipment comes the plastic wear. For the plastic wear, um, nowadays, um, glass equipment is, um, we, we always try to use um, sterile equipment from the companies and um, especially in my lab um, it's our practice we do not use we do, we do not use auto, uh, autoclave equipment because it really leads to contamination destroys the experiments and wastes a lot of time chemicals and things so we always use disposable equipment and if financially it is possible you can afford it then of course try to use as much sterile and um, um, sterile packed pipettes or other things for cell culturing. We have a wide variety of uh, these plastic ware available. They are very good quality. Most of them for cell culture are pre-treated uh, pre and coated with collagen or other uh, materials that facilitate the growth of cells or adherence of cells. Choosing the right material depends on what kind of experiment you're doing, what kind of, uh, how much cells you need. If you need a lot of cells and you have a lot of material and you want to like make a cell lysate and store it or do it, use it for a long term, then you can have, you can um, have uh, cells, uh, gross, uh, you can grow cells in petri dishes, 
you can grow cells in cell culture flasks. But in case you want to uh, do certain experiments like uh, microscopy, live cell imaging, then it's not possible to use these big flasks or something. Then you have to use specific microscopic slides that are specific for the to grow cells and they are specified for the microscopic use. And um, then uh, preferably, if possible, use the um, caps with filter for the flasks because the cell culture flasks are available with the filters and without the filters. I would always recommend using uh, flasks with filters because then, you know, you cannot have outside contamination because the thing is from the incubator, you take the cells out and you bring the cells to the flow hood. Now, this, um, this taking out the cells and then bringing the cells to the flow hood or from the flow hood, taking the cells out and putting them into the incubator can also, because we have the normal air in between and a lot of contamination can occur. Um, so try to use filter caps for the incubators. Then um, for certain experiments, people use sealed flasks. Well, then you can trap the CO2 and 95% CO2 and 95% air and leave them for as long as you think it's, um, you know, as the when the medium color changes or um, till your desired time period, you can have a look. It depends on the experiment you're conducting. Petri dishes, as I was telling you earlier. Petri dishes, in Petri dishes, the cells, uh, you can see a Petri dishes. Petri dish has a big surface area and the cells are accessible. This is the plus point. We can observe them under the microscope. If you want to grow cells and then we need a lot of cells, then Petri dishes are good. Um, but in any case, still, Petri dishes have a limited surface area as compared to the flasks. Uh, and of course, the Petri dishes are um, a lot of work as well. You have to be very careful. You can spill. Uh, a lot of problems can occur. So. Uh, I, I would not suggest the use or I would not uh, advise the use of Petri dishes um, for regular experiments. Then we have standing Erlenmeyer flasks. These Erlenmeyer flasks are, flasks are good for suspended cultures like these cell cultures. They are low maintenance. You just um, put them in a shaking incubator and then they keep on growing with a lot of medium, they'll keep on growing and then you can strain the cells, you can separate the cells, centrifuge the cells and remove the supernatant. But you really, you can have um, a lot of cells, but the problem is you cannot really observe the cells. You cannot observe the morphology of the cells. You cannot really observe any um, contamination of there is, of or if there is any change in their morphology, you really cannot observe in the suspended cell cultures. The best um, equipment for the and for the cell culture, I would suggest, and I personally also use these. These are T flasks with uh, filter caps. They are the best. They are available in different sizes. Uh, they are coated with the uh, specific materials to facilitate uh, cell adherence. They are commonly used everywhere in each and every lab. They're stackable. You can have like um, 50 flasks in one incubator because you can stack them on each other. Um, you can observe these under a microscope very effectively. There is no problem with that. You can really uh, create a very nice monolayer of cells for certain experiments. But of course, there, it also has its disadvantages that um, when the cells are growing in these flasks, they start adhering and forming clusters around the corners. 
and then it's very difficult to separate them sometimes, especially if you're doing um, mechanical um, um, removal of the cells from the flasks, not trypsinizing, but if you're doing it mechanically, then it becomes a problem to go into the nooks and corners, but still um, it's the best method that I would recommend. Then we have roller flasks. Roller flasks are good, but they're also for um, suspended cells. I would never recommend them for adherent cells or their experiments. But of course, if you have suspended cells and you really want to grow them in, in a big quantity, in a large quantity, so you can use these suspended cells and then of course centrifuge and remove the, you know, take the, um, take the cell pallet and use them for the experiments. In other plastic where what comes? Multi-well dishes, as I told you earlier, we have four well plates, we have eight well, six well, 12 well, 96 well plates, and then we have specific um, slides for microscopy and we grow cells inside them and observe them. If we want to have um, live imaging of the cells, then we need to carry on this uh, we, we need to grow the cells in these specific slides otherwise we won't be able to we won't be able to observe them under the microscope sterilization of the cells this is a very uh, sterilization of the equipment and um, of the waste this is a very important uh, topic because whatever um, debris or whatever waste we have from the cell culture uh, experiments, then we have to autoclave them. We just cannot throw all this uh, waste into the normal uh, waste bin. We have to have uh, specific bags, autoclavable bags, and we have to put each and everything, including the pipettes, the slides, the flasks, whatever we are using for the, uh, for the cell culture purpose, we have to uh, throw them away. Then um, for the buffers and the medium and the water, what do we do? What do we do? Because we also, for, um, for a sterile, it is aseptic um, atmosphere and procedure, we need all these things sterile. So normally a common practice is this, that we always order sterile materials from the farms, sterile packed medium, sterile packed water or whatever, but of course, we can um, autoclave all these things um, ourselves as well, um, such as pipit tips, uh, if we need some glass pipits or uh, we need some, uh, if there are some glass plasts that we need uh, for certain experiments, then we can always autoclave them as well. Glassware has to be autoclaved at 160 degrees centigrade for one hour. And normally uh, the, the autoclave is at 121 degrees centigrade, steam under pressure for 20 minutes. And then uh, this has to be done for all the waste and debris that, um, that are used during the um, cell culture experiments. Now comes the storage of the cells. What do we do? Because as we all know, these cell lines are immortal. Most of them are immortal other than the primary cell lines that we develop ourselves from the tissues or organs. But the routine cell lines, the cancer cell lines or the other cell lines that are commercially available, they are immortal. So what do we do? We, we can't order for each experiment uh, a very expensive cell line and then uh, use it once and, you know, just the cells destroyed. And then we have to order uh, for a couple of hundred euros or a thousand dollars a brand new cell line again. This is not possible. So what do we do? What should we do? Cells should be regularly frozen. Actually, when we order the cell line from the company, the first thing that we should do is we should grow them and we should um, freeze them. Freeze the first batch of the cells that comes from the company. We grow them and then we freeze them in batches. Never forget to label the date, um, the passage. And um, this is a very important aspect of cell culture because you know technically you, you can grow cells for years, doesn't matter. But 
at one point, they start, uh, physiological changes start occurring in the cells, morphological changes start occurring in the cell, and they are no longer useful for the purpose they, are, they were intended for. So what do we do? We have to monitor all the passages and we always have to um, see that um, we have a fresh batch always saved and frozen. Why cells can be contaminated anytime. Some, some disaster can occur in the lab, something can happen in the lab. So what would we do? You will be left with nothing then if you have cells frozen in, a, in the nitrogen um, setup, then you can just take out one vial, thaw it, use it again. Uh, in order to freeze the cells, a freezing mediums, medium contains preservatives. Preservatives are very important. Why? Because uh, we have to prevent water from forming ice crystals. Why water has to be prevented from forming ice crystals? Because you know the small crystals, they're very sharp and they will kill each and every cell that has been frozen. So we have to make sure there are no crystals formed in the solution. And to do that, we add glycerine, we add dimethyl sulfoxide, we have special freezing vials. And of course, the freezing has to be done slowly in special styrofoam boxes or special cryo freezing boxes, which are about one inch thing thick. And the freezing um, is carried on slowly when the cells are put into those boxes and then put into the freezer, that it's like one degree centigrade per minute gradually. And then afterwards, say after two hours or three hours or one or two days, you can take out from the minus 80 degrees centigrade and for permanent storage, you can store the cells in the liquid nitrogen at one nine, minus 196 degrees centigrade. Cryopreservation is a method whereby cells can be... Uh, can you hear this video now? Yes, yes we, we can. Yes, okay. we do, ma'am. Thank you. Cryopreservation is a method whereby cells can be frozen. It is critical in maintaining healthy and viable cells. This is stressful for cells due to the cryoprotectant and low temperatures required for freezing. Clean hood with 70% ethanol. Pre-warmed medium and reagents are kept in the hood. Liquid waste discarder is also kept in the hood after wiping with 70% ethanol. Hands are sterilized. Before cryopreservation, cells should be in a log phase of growth free of contamination and should have over 75% viability. For adherent cells, the medium from the flask is removed by piping or pouring out. Cells are washed with PBS and this process is repeated twice.
Add trypsin to remove cells from the flask. Confirm with a microscope that the trypsinization is complete. Once detached, cells appear round and move as the flask is moved. Complete disassociation of cells is important. Add 2 ml of complete medium to inactivate trypsin. Pipe it repeatedly to break clumps and achieve a single cell suspension. Transfer the suspension in 15 ml conical tube. Centrifuge at 1000 rpm for 5 minutes. While the cells are in centrifuge, prepare freezing medium and cryo vials. A pre-freezed cooling device is used for slow and steady cooling. This is used to achieve a minus 1 degree centigrade per minute rate of cooling. Cryo vials are labeled with the date, name of researcher, cell line, passage number and lab number. To prepare freezing medium for cell culture, fetal bovine serum, incomplete media and DMSO is used. Cryo medium recipe for this example is 90% FPS, 5% media and 5% DMSO. Freezing medium is prepared in a falcon tube on ice. Cryoprotective agents reduce the freezing point of the medium and allow a slower cooling rate and greatly reduce the risk of ice crystal formation.
After obtaining the pallet, supinant is removed and the pallet is resuspended in freezing medium to final required density. Generally for mammalian cells, 1 million cells per ml of freezing medium is used. Alacot 1 ml into labeled cryo vials. Place the cryovials into a cool cell to ensure a temperature change by 1 degree centigrade. This is then kept at minus 80 degree freezer. The aliquots and tubes are sealed with parafilm tape at the end of the work. The work hood is cleaned with 70% ethanol. After overnight in minus 80 degree freezer, the cryo vials are shifted to liquid nitrogen for long term storage. This was cell revival is a now the previous video was about cryopreservation. What we can do is I actually I am trying to make it an interactive session as well instead of having these separately. So can, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. So what I have done is I have incorporated these videos into my lecture now. If you uh, have any questions, you can ask me now also, and you can ask related to these procedures or anything afterwards also. It is up to you people. So would you like to uh, um, ask questions afterwards? Or if you have any questions now, could, you could let me know. Uh, Dr. Sola, there are some questions that are posted on, on the chat. So um, Kiran is... Uh, Very stressful. Okay, okay. okay. Kiran, that, can you read, uh, um, read these um, questions. That was, so far, there's only yes. been one question that was asking how much trypsin should one use and for how long? Yeah, we will come to that afterwards, but I can tell you right away. All, um, it depends, but actually trypsin should not be used more than uh, for more than three minutes. 0.5 percent or and we have to see but it depends sometimes the cells are um, destroyed and uh, uh, 
because you know trypsin basically destroys the cellular matrix that is surrounding the cells and they maintains which maintains its adherence and morphology so we have to be very careful so we have to optimize and we it should i never use it for more than 3 minutes for my cells and i always uh, tell other um, students and other um, you know scientists as well that we should be very careful with with trypsin because since we we have to use trypsin for most almost all the experiments and for the cell massaging and for the cell culture so we have to be careful because at the end of the day it destroys the cellular matrix so it destroys a lot inside the cells it, it can um, really ruin your results at at one point so we have to be very careful but we will come to the cell trypsinizing and um, other procedures afterwards so i can see some questions here uh dr sunna there was only one question here and uh, so you can now start your lecture okay so now we will come to the procedure we earlier saw the video of cryo um, the preservation of the cells because i told you that it's important that the cells need to be preserved we cannot really carry on uh, keep on um, trypsinizing the cells using the cells use at the end of the day they will be totally different from what you started and now how to revive them process for them to endure to aid your cell survival perform each step quickly under optimal conditions cell revival is a very stressful process for them to endure to aid your cell survival perform each step quickly under optimal conditions Clean the hood with 70% ethanol and set up before taking the vial out of liquid nitrogen. For this experiment, complete medium that is supplemented with 10% FBS, T25 culture flasks and 15 ml centrifuge tubes are required. Ten ml of pre-warmed medium is pipetted into fifteen ml centrifuge tube. Liquid nitrogen is handled with extreme caution and by trained personnel. A complete set of PPEs including gloves and face shield is required to work safely. Work quickly so that no cells thaw out of the liquid nitrogen container. The required cells are taken out and kept in a cool container. Dry ice can also be used. The boxes are carefully placed back into the liquid nitrogen after the work is done. The process for cell revival is same for both adherent and suspension cell lines.
The vial of cells is thawed in the palm of the hand. Water bath can also be used. Although care should be taken not to submerge the vial in the water bath to avoid contamination. When a small chunk of ice is remaining, transfer the contents of the vial to a 15 ml centrifuge tube. The tube is then centrifuged. This allows the cells to settle down and DMSO is removed from the media. The cells are resuspended in an appropriate volume of complete medium. The medium volume and number of flasks depend on the number of cells frozen in the vial. Usually, a small T25 flask is used for cell revival to allow cell-to-cell -cell contact. The resuspended cell pallet is then transferred to the flask. A north-south, east-west rocking motion ensures even distribution of cells. The cells are then incubated at 37 degrees centigrade with 5% carbon dioxide and checked for adherence and morphology the next day. Now, I've shown you these two techniques of cryopreservation and cryorevive. If you have any questions, we can later discuss them. And uh, now I can carry on with the requirements and equipments that uh, equipments and uh, the things that are required further for cell culture. But this was the foremost thing that is required for cell culture cryo revive and cryo preservation because otherwise without these two techniques it's practically useless to uh, conduct any cell culture experiment. <clears throat> now sterile water sterile water is a must for the cell culture procedures why it has several uses first of all first and the foremost you have to use water to um, maintain a humid atmosphere in the incubator and uh, without that, it's not possible to grow any cells inside the incubator. So, but you cannot really use the tap water that is flowing in the lab and you cannot add that water to the incubator. This water has to be sterile. Then sometimes in certain labs, they, manu they make their own media, like from the powdered solution, of, uh, the powdered material, they add it to the water and they make their own medium. You need autoclave, sterile water. Then for the buffers also, sometimes in some labs, they mix your own buffer or sometimes you need to make certain buffer that is not commercially as such available or you have to make it on your own. Then you need sterile water for that purpose. The water has to be double distilled. And um, also has to uh, uh, go through the reverse osmotic uh, osmosis systems. Reverse osmosis system means that the, the water that's coming from the reservoir has to be filtered with a membrane through a membrane so that the solutes are remain the solutes are left behind and um, the, um, the water without any solutes or any solutions it um, it strains through that and then we can double distilled it. These are some um, distillation um, um, 
things or uh, filters that are used for uh, cell culturing. And you can see that the filter size is 0.22 uh, micro, um, uh, micrometers. Um, and um, mostly this is the filter size that has to be used for the for filtering of the cells. Now, after cryopreservation, cryo revival, what do we need to do? A very important procedure is to maintain the cells, to passage the cells, to use the cells for the experiments. And actually, for most of the experiments, we need to count cells because like in if a 96 well plate, um, we have to conduct an experiment or we have to do something um, or we have to perform an, a cell viability test. We need to have the cell number counted. Otherwise, it is not possible for us to optimize the, te um, the experimental conditions. So what, uh, what do we do? Cell counting. There is Coulter counting, optical density measurement and hemocytometer. The most common one is through hemocytometer. Hemocytometer is this device which is um, available um, and it's a small slide and I will explain it to you how this slide functions. The cells were cultured and maintained at 90% confluency in a humidified 37 degrees centigrade, 5% carbon dioxide incubator. The cells were detached using 1 ml trypsin and centrifuge to obtain a pallet. The cells are resuspended in 1 ml of media. The cells are pipetted a few times to ensure a single cell suspension. A hemocytometer is used to quantify the number of cells in suspension to determine the seeding density for subsequent assays. Tripen blue dye is used with the dilution of 2 is to 1 to distinguish between live and dead cells. Ten microliter of the dilution is mounted on the hemocytometer. Live cells appear as bright and shiny spheres, whereas the dead appear dark blue due to the penetration of the dye. All four squares containing 16 subsquares are counted to obtain an average of cells. The counting is done in a zigzag manner to avoid confusion. Only two boundaries are taken in consideration when counting cells near them. To calculate cell concentration per ml, average number of cell in one large square 
is multiplied with the dilution factor into 10 raised to power 4. This gives the number of cells per ml. The percentage of viability is determined by dividing the number of viable cells counted with total cells counted into 100. To plate a certain seeding density of cells, following calculation is done. Number of cells seeded per well are multiplied with total volume required in each well. This is then divided by the number of cells counted. For example, if 205 into 10 raised to power 4 cells are counted and 6 into 10 raised to power 4 cells are required in each well, 6 into 10 raised to power 4 is multiplied by the volume of medium required in each well divided by the number of cells counted. With this calculation, 29.2 microliter of cells are required for each well. This volume is then subtracted from the final volume to maintain the volume to volume ratio. With the previous calculation, 970.8 microliter of complete medium is added to each well. Twenty nine point two microliter of cell suspension is then added to each well. In north, south, east, west, rocking and shores, proper distribution of cells. The plate is labelled and is kept in the incubator for the cells to attain their morphology. Now this was about cell counting. I wish we could have we could be we could have been able to do these in person, all these experiments and all these things. But still, we we will try to learn as much as we can from all this. Now, then talking about the equipments and materials, we we come to the general items. The general items needed for the cell culture is uh, they are mostly aspiration pumps, vials tubes, flasks, all these things, they are very important and we should be having all of them within reach in the cell culture lab. Cell culture centrifuge, um, refrigeration, racks and stands, they are also very important. Then inside the hood, we should have these covered Eppendorf or any other um, pipette stands which are needed because everything has to be sterile, covered and we cannot leave them uh, out in open for contamination. So everything that belongs to the hood has to be covered. Plastic pipettes, suction aid. Now we come to the medium. Cell culture media, we, we have um, discussed all the things that were needed. And in the beginning, when I was telling you about the history, I told you that um, afterwards, um, later on, early 1900, uh, early 20th century, um, they decided to design a specific media so that as to facilitate cell growth. Now, <clears throat> the standardized basic media are balanced salt solutions for the cell cultures. They're isotonic. They contain carbohydrates, amino acids, vitamins, proteins, and peptides. They also contain inorganic ions. Normally, the buffer media is always uh, above, uh, the cell culture media is always a buffer system. 
and the optimum pH for cell culture growth is between 7.4 to 7.7. .7. So always the this type of um, pH is maintained in the buffers so as to facilitate the cell growth. When the cells are incubated in the carbon dioxide atmosphere, an equilibrium is maintained between the medium and the gas phase. The bicarbonate carbon dioxide buffering system is most often used due to its low toxicity towards the cells. Then we have, uh, I will tell you later about the HAPES buffer, um, but um, any media that has to be used has to have a bicarbonate concentration, carbon dioxide tension to achieve the correct pH. But of course, um, the lab, um, media and its constituents can vary for cell line, cell type, the labs and everything. Media also contains cell specific additives, hormones, growth factors, and it depends upon the cell type between five to 20% of the fetal bovine serum. And of course, it also has to have a pH indicator normally, which is, um, um, we have phenol red in normal cases. Uh, Dr. Sona, there are some questions. Uh, would you like to answer them? Okay, later? yes, yes, yes. Uh, I'm going to the chair. Uh, Ms. Kiran uh, will read these questions. Um, Ms. Rasia Sanit has a question. Uh, how many times do you wash the cells with medium when you take it from cryotube? Yeah, actually, well, um, when we want to revive the cells, uh, personally, from my personal experience, sometimes, you know, the cells are very, very fragile when we thaw them. So what I do is, and I also tell my students as well this, um, try to just very, very... Um, centrifuge them uh, or very at a very slow RPM so that you can remove the excess uh, freezing medium. But if you think that it is not good for the cells and uh, they will not revive effectively. So what you can do is from my experience, what I do personally is sometimes when I have a very fragile cell line and mm -hmm. I want to revive it and I do not want to destroy it sometimes like, for example, there is a prostate carcinoma cell line LN cap. It's a very sensitive cell line. So what I do is I do not wash it at all. And I um, take one to 10 ratio of the medium and um, the freezing medium, like the regular medium at 37 degrees and the, uh, the you know frozen pellet of the cells. And I add it to it, shake it very lightly, like south, uh, north, south, east, west, and just put it inside the equip um, incubator. Then afterwards, say for example, after one hour, I observe the cells under the microscope. And if I see any signs of adherence or any sign of cells, you know, forming their, uh, coming back to their shape, then I remove it. Or um, sometimes what I do is I leave them for six hours or seven hours in the lab. And then after six to seven hours, I check them. I see the adherence, I see the morphology and I then, change the medium. I do not wash them in the beginning, but I wash them after they have slowly started adhering to the um, flask. But one time washing is okay if, if your cell lines are robust and you feel it's okay, but do not overdo it. Do not overdo the freezing medium and the normal medium washing, never ever. Otherwise you will just destroy the cells. This question is from Professor Reta. Uh, he asks, how much volume do you put into the incubator? What do you... Uh, in, uh, how much volume of uh, medium in the uh, incubator? I believe he's asking um, about the water that we put in the water tank. Ah, oh, yes, yes, yes. I normally, in the regular routine incubator, I add uh, 200 ml of water. And I keep an eye on it. If it's evaporating, uh, then I um, add more. 
but it, 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 first of all, it depends on the size of the incubator. There should be a very thin layer of water at the bottom. It should not be flooding with water so that the water is not flowing outside or it's not uh, like, you know, um, everywhere, but it should be at the end of the, at, at the uh, back bottom area of the incubator. So I think normally for me, I use 200 ml of water and that's enough for me. But I of course keep an eye on the volume so that it does not evaporate. Sometimes if you don't keep an eye on it, it evaporates and then the cells at the end of the day die. Okay, Next question. Huh? You were saying something, I interrupted you, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Uh, I, I said yes, the next question. He continues asking if we need to add copper salt uh, in order to avoid fungal contamination. Um, yes, we can do that. We can do that, but I do not personally do it. I add it, um, I add salts to the, this, um, to, uh, the thawing uh, device, but I do not add anything to the incubator. To the water in the incubator. I do not. We should be very, uh, we should work in sterile atmosphere ourselves. We should train ourselves to avoid contamination rather than relying on these chemicals because I, I, I mean, it, it, they, they make precipitates and it's no use. But you can, if you are having uh, like recurring cases of contamination, you can use these measures. Next question. Next. Next question is from Alpala Sultan. Um, mm -hmm. There is reason behind using 10% FBS and is it ethically correct to collect FBS from pregnant cows? Is there any other reason uh, for it or not? I, I can't hear you properly. Um, the I, voice is breaking. I repeat the question. Can you hear me now? Yes. I'll repeat the question. Um, reason behind using 10% FBS, and is it ethically correct to collect FBS from pregnant cows? Yeah, this is a very, very uh, controversial question. Now, although there is much research that is now aimed at attempting to reduce the use of uh, uh, serum for the cells, and nowadays, many labs are trying to use serum-free labs. And uh, there are certain companies that have developed um, certain um, other additives that could replace the fetal bovine serum. But at the moment, it's, it's not ethically um, appreciated as such. But up till now, we don't have a very effective... Um, alternative still in like more than 60 to 70 percent labs still we are using fetal bovine serum ethically i wouldn't say it is correct and we all try to use serum free medium as much as possible but sometimes it is the requirement of cell growth and we do not have such effective alternatives so it's a it's a debatable question yes you're right um, the next question is from Mr. Noor Rahman. He wants to know if we are using already sterile ready-made media. Is it, is it necessary to filter it again? No, no, no. If you are, if you are buying sterile media from the company, <clears throat> you don't have to sterile it again. I just, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I just, I just told you about the <clears throat> um, the filter size and all these things because sometimes there are certain additives and certain things that we have to use in the cells or during our experiments, but they have to be sterile. Say, for example, specifically, if you are um, making a solution and you want to do an experiment on the live cells and you want to do imaging or other experiments on live cells, like live cell imaging uh, or live cell uh, 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 facts, flow cytometry, then what you have to do, you cannot contaminate the cells because if you will not use sterile uh, solutions of the compounds that are using or the drug solutions that you want to use, then you will contaminate the cells and the experiment will be ruined. So in order to do that, you need to know which filter pore is to be used 
but the normal serum med uh, the normal medium that comes uh, sterile from the companies you do not have to do anything with that Last but sometimes it's the requirement of the experiment yes please carry on hello <clears throat> I can't hear you. Hello. Hello. Can you? The hear voice me? was broken. Now I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Um. The next question. And he wants to know if there are like, There is a lot of disturbance. I can't hear. I can hear your voice, but I can't hear the question. I am. I apologize for the inconvenience. I will repeat the question. Oh, no. Um, the number of cells. In, a, in the example uh, for, for cell counting, we showed a six well plate. So Professor Riza wants to know if he wants to have an experiment in a nine well, 16 well, and 96 well plate, how much medium should he use? Well, it depends uh, personally. Um, 200 and for, a, for what, what I use from my experience, for my experiments, what I use is for a four well plate, I use. 200 uh, microliters of the total medium for an experiment. And for a 96 well plate, I use, for optimal experiment, I use uh, 50 microliters or 100 microliters. 50 microliters is the best amount, the uh, volume of the uh, total medium with the cell, um, the cell lysate to be used. So the, you're talking about the total. So 96 into 50 microliters, you can calculate how much you need and you just always make a little bit more. Say for example, what I do is 100 into 50. And so I will make um, 5 ml, 5,000 microliters. Yes. Um, the next question is how to reduce contamination. Yes. Well, to reduce contamination, there are very, very um, subtle techniques. First of all, which normally people forget. Never ever open the incubator for a longer period and never, never talk in front of the incubator when it's open. This is the first thing. The first rule that I always tell, never breathe in front of the incubator right when it's open. You know, breathe out, never. Try to be very quick, take out the cell flask, put inside the, um, take it to the hood, and carry on. But people don't do that. You know, you open the incubator and you forget about it. And then you're talking and you're looking at the cells and you're breathing flasks. No, this is a deadly technique. This leads to the most contamination. Clean your filters, check your hood, uh, sterile your, always disinfect your hands, always disinfect the material, always, always disinfect the microscope. Um, area where you put the slide or where you put the flasks. Always, always disinfect those areas. So there are small, th small things that the cell culture, basically, you know, it's very subtle. And you have to keep this in mind that anything that you do um, rapidly without thinking can lead to contamination. You know, the routine contamination we can avoid uh, inside the medium by using antibiotics, 
but there are certain experiments when we cannot use antibiotics. So we have to be careful with that. We have all, uh, and fetal bovine serum is the biggest cause of contamination because fetal bovine serum always, when you open one fresh bottle of fetal bovine serum, make it, uh, you know, divide it into alicots of how much you use, like for, for one flask you use, you say, for example, 10 ml, 10%, uh, make that 10 ml, uh, small append off, divide all of them into 10 ml, uh, you know, uh, tubes, and then freeze them. Always take the specific amount out, thaw it and use it. So there are small, very small, subtle things that can lead to contamination, but we normally do not realize it. So we always have to be very, very particular about these things. And the rest, of course, we have to be careful with the filters, with our hood, with the water that we use. We always should be checking everything. And of course, once or twice a month, we should clean our incubator. Um, and moreover, we should also uh, always control the contamination level of our buffers and mediums and all these things. So we should uh, have a control, um, one empty flask of um, medium in the, in, in, inside the incubator so that if there is contamination, the color will change, we'll know that. So there are small methods we should be keeping in view, uh, keeping in mind, and we should do that. Uh, hello, I have a question. Uh, should we use the fan uh, on during Never. our work? No, absolutely not. No air. No air from outside. And what about the suction pump? Uh, how much time we have to use it before our work? Uh, the suction pump for what? Um, we are using the laminar hood and we have a suction pump in our lab. I'm working on parasite and mm -hmm. uh, um, before using the hood, we used to prefer the suction pump on to mm -hmm. uh, just clean the environment. Yes, and, yes. Uh, you know the uh, exact, uh, uh, I just want to know the uh, accurate time for using that suction pump. How much time we have to use that suction pump on before our work? Yes, it depends on the size of your um, you know, hood, your room. And uh, okay. what I would suggest is what I would suggest is that you turn it on in the morning when you have your SL experiments planned and you mm. do not turn it off till you uh, finish everything and you know your, you, you are sure that now your room is completely or your hood is completely sterile. You, it depends on how big it is. But, but personally, I would, I, because we don't have uh, this equipment, we, we just have our sterile rooms. The whole atmosphere is sterile because we do not let any outside air come inside the, the labs. And as, as I showed you in the video also at um, ICCBS as well, you know, these rooms are all closed with the filters and there is no air from the outside coming inside. So that's a different procedure. But for you, you need to see how big is the room, how big is the uh, laminar flow hood. And okay. I think Thank at you. the beginning of the experiment, you know, when you know, you start well ahead and then keep it running for a while. Okay, uh, will you please tell me the uh, time of, of using fan before the experiment? How much time we have to uh, open the fan of hood before using that hood? Yes, um, at least, at least, at least 15 minutes. This is the least. This is okay. the least. This is the least, but you actually, when, say for example, I want to start my experiment, and I come in the morning, this is the first thing I'll do. I'll turn on the hood. Okay. And I keep it running. Uh, okay, we use um, UV before uh, the fan on. Is it right? Yes, UV is okay. But actually, you know, uh, for UV, always leave it overnight. And you don't have to okay. use UV every day. No, what, what I do personally, 
in my lab. We once a week we put the UV lights on, uh, and we just uh, you know leave it overnight, and then it's sterile. But if you want to use it, ten minutes, fifteen minutes before the work, UV light is okay. It's no problem. But okay, it, thank it you. Be, you cannot immediately start anything. You know you have to have ample time before starting the experiment to turn on the hood to turn on the exhaust and to to if you if you turn on the uv and it's a regular practice that also requires 10, 10 to 15 minutes for the sterilization okay next or anything else uh these were the questions so far so i request you to continue the session please okay thank you i don't know there is a strange blue sign uh, that appeared like some mark appeared in my presentation i don't know how it got here but okay but i i don't know how it is here it was not earlier in my presentation so we were talking about the cell cultures and uh, media and buffers. Now, as I told you that they, we have different meat types of medium uh, media, we have different supplements. We also have to keep in mind the cell line, the cell type, how long do we need? What kind of experiment do we have to do? Because there are, you know, sometimes there are certain experiments which require serum free medium. So we have to keep in mind and we have to really read the instructions because say, for example, there are certain cell invasion experiments that, uh, that we do. And, um, and the cell invasion experiments means the movement of cells through, through the membrane. And uh, in the beginning, so we have to grow the cells without the serum. So we have to keep in mind what, uh, what is the requirement of the experiment also at, at the end of the day, because all the cell culture that we are doing is for the experiments to be conducted on the cells. Now, cell culture media and buffers. We have simple media, that's PVS, uh, phosphate buffered cell line. Then we have the washing media. Washing media, also I, and normally everybody washes the cells with PBS. Then we have a transfer media. Incubation media is trypsin. It contains trypsin with PBS 0 0.25, 0 0.5%. It depends on how your cells are. Then we have the growth media, we have extra metabolites, we have the minerals, we have vitamins and salts, and then we have essential amino acids, and then we have non-essential amino acids also sometimes. So it depends on the cell lines. We have, we have a large variety and uh, a large variety of basic buffers, a large variety of um, these um, additives for the medium. The main, as I told you earlier, also cell culture media and buffers, the, we have a bicarbonate system. Uh, there is an equilibrium that is maintained between the uh, medium and the gas phase, the carbon dioxide gas phase, and it has to be low toxic for the cell. The, the medium cannot be toxic for the cells. Then we have the HAPIS system. The HEPA system is 4,2-hydroxyethyl, uh, one piprazine uh, ethane sulfonic acid. It does not require carbon dioxide infusion. The adjustment for endogenous carbon dioxide metabolism, the, 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 the internal metabolism of carbon dioxide is required. And um, these um, in this medium, the pyruvate for the cells uh, is using the carbon dioxide and the high buffer concentrations for cell producing CO2. But normally we do not use um, HEPIS buffer. And um, it um, HEPIS uh, can only maintain pH in the absence of exogenous carbon dioxide. When we do not have the carbon dioxide in the incubator, then we have to use the HEPIS buffer. Normally we, normally, normally we don't use this HEPIS buffer. It is for specific cell lines or certain specific experiments. 
I personally have never used Hibisca, but we always use the DMEM or MEM or um, um, other buffers. Now, the cell culture additives, specifically the, uh, these additives are, as I told you earlier, they are specifically adjusted for the cell lines. There are essential amino acids, cysteine, tyrosine, glutamine as energy source and carbon source in the addition to glut glucose. Glutamine concentration, normally we use two, um, two millimolar concentration. And um, one very important thing that we have to remember about glutamine is this, that it is only stable for three weeks at four degrees centigrade. So if we add the final concentration of glutamine of two millimolar in, uh, in our buffers, uh, in our uh, medium, then we have to be careful. We have to mark the date because it is only stable for three weeks at four degrees centigrade. And the stock solution should always be stored at 20 degrees, uh, minus 20 or at minus 80 degrees. Um, otherwise, um, it's, um, it's no use. It's um, decomposed and um, technically then it's not there in the medium. Serum, complex mixture of compounds. We do not know how many compounds are exactly present in the serum then that serum and exactly that is why it is very difficult to find an alternative for the serum and um, we use uh, fetal calf calf and horse serum but normally we use fetal calf serum optimal um, uh, now uh, how to optimize the concentration of the fe uh, serum in the fetal serum in the medium it depends on the cell line say for example in the in the routine cell lines, we use 10%, and there are certain cell lines um, which use uh, which need 15%. Uh, there are certain which need 25%. Like in, in normally in um, hex cells, I always add 15% of serum, but in the other cell lines, I just add 10% uh, of the serum. It it depends. It depends on the cell lines. It depends on the instruction that have been given by the, the company that has provided you with the cell lines, that which, um, what type of serum and how much serum concentration has to be in the uh, medium. S special antibiotics also, nowadays we use them commonly unless it is a requirement not to use in the experiment because it um, really reduces the contamination rate, bacterial contamination especially, and uh, commonly used antibiotics are penicillin, streptomycin solution. Broad, uh, broad spectrum antibiotics like carnamycin, amphotericin, antimyocotics, they are also sometimes used, but the most common one is penstrept mixture that is being used. Mycoplasma directed antibiotic biotics plasmosin. Mycoplasma is a very, very common. Um, mycoplasm contamination is a very common type of contamination and the worst type of contamination because you really can't see the mycoplasm as well under the microscope also, and it really destroys the cells. So, um, plasmosin also is, um, but if you see, um, if you can't see the if you feel as if your cells are not growing um, fast enough and um, there is a certain change in their morphology adherence, then maybe uh, sometimes it is advisable to use plasmosine once or twice so that you can get rid of the cells, uh, get rid of the mycoplasm if there is any. Cell culture medium. Uh, now, normally, in all the labs, we use the ready-made medium. The ready-to-use ready medium is expensive, but it is very commonly commercially available. Um, but if you want to save money, then the medium is also available in powdered form and you can mix in your lab in double distilled, sterilized water, and then you can afterwards also sterilize the media. But um, it's, it, it always leads to contamination. I really 
um, there is no guarantee of uh, um, real sterility in these case, in in such cases. Nowadays, it's seldom used. These this powdered media, which has to be made, you yourself have to uh, you know make in the lab is is not very common and it's not as advisable as well. Now the sterile filtration that I was talking about earlier and somebody question asked me a question also like hormones, glutamine, serum and all these things. If they are not sterile and you have to add them from your lab, uh, then you have to sterile filter each and everything. Basic guy, now the cell culture media, we can summarize it in uh, this way that the basic guideline or basic instructions are available for every cell line for the media to be used. Every cell culture or every, every cell culture experiment or every cell culture lab has its own uh, way and method also. Um, so, um, some additional equipments, if you will give me a minute, I'll be back. So, um, some additional equipments uh, that uh, we need for the cell culture is low temperature freezing, glassware washing machine, closed circuit TV, colony counter, cell sizing, time lapse, uh, micrography, controlled rate cooler, centrifugal eluterator, Florence uh, fax, uh, fax machine, uh, controlled rate cooler. Sorry, th this has been repeated, but um, so we can. Now we go to the techniques. Now we start with the cell splitting technique because we discussed all the things of cryopreservation, cryo revive and everything. And now how to actively split the cells and cultivate them. Growth of cells in culture follow a standard pattern. Cells should be passaged when they cover the plate or the density exceeds the capacity of the medium. Hood is cleaned with 70% ethanol. Reagents and medium are pre-warmed at 37 degrees centigrade in a water bath. Before retrieving your flasks from the incubator, set up the hood with required supplies. Medium and PBS is allocated to avoid repeated cool warm cycles and risk of contamination. Flask is observed under the microscope to check cell viability health and possible contamination. For adherent cells, remove the spent medium from the flask by pipetting or pouring out. The cells are washed with 3 ml PBS the process is repeated twice. It is done to remove debris and residues of media.
add trypsin to remove cells. Just enough amount to cover the flask. Flask is incubated at 37 degrees centigrade to facilitate the reaction. Use a microscope to confirm cell detachment. The cells would appear as round and would move freely. Add complete medium with 10% FBS to inactivate trypsin from further reaction. Pipe it repeatedly to manually break the lingering clumps. Fifteen ml of centrifuge tubes are used to pellet cells down. Transfer the cells to the tube. Use a water tube to balance. Centrifuge at 1000 RPM for 5 minutes. The speed of centrifugation also depends on your cell line. Uh, we apologize for the inconvenience. There seems to be have a connectivity issue with Dr. Sumla. Uh, she'll reconnect in a minute. Please bear with us. Uh, may I have your attention, please? I would like to um, announce that there is a 15 minutes break as we are struggling with the connectivity issue. 
um, please bear with us and we apologize for the inconvenience. Thank you very much. Bye. To mention that the same link could be used to continue the session after 15 minutes break. The, sec the session will continue at 2.30. Hello? Yes, yes ma'am. 15 minutes. And now we get back to the lecture. Um, as I told you earlier, we will start with the, we'll, because what I did was basically not to make it a very boring lecture. I incorporated the videos in, in, into the lecture, but you do not have to worry if you have any questions during or afterwards here. But I am making it a mix and match sort of a thing so that you don't really get bored by me talking all the time and also not just uh, looking at the videos. ...of cells in culture follow a standard pattern. Growth of cells in culture follow a standard pattern. Cells should be passaged when they cover the plate or the density exceeds the capacity of the medium. Hood is cleaned with 70% ethanol. Reagents and medium are pre-warmed at 37 degrees centigrade in a water bath. Before retrieving your flasks from the incubator, set up the hood with required supplies. Medium and PBS is allocated to avoid repeated cool warm cycles and risk of contamination. Flask is observed under the microscope to check cell viability, health and possible contamination. For adherent cells, remove the spent medium from the flask by pipetting or pouring out. The cells are washed with 3 ml PBS. The process is repeated twice. It is done to remove debris and residues of media. Add trypsin to remove cells, just enough amount to cover the flask. Flask is incubated at 37 degrees centigrade to facilitate the reaction. Use a microscope to confirm cell detachment. The cells would appear as round and would move freely. Add complete medium with 10% FBS to inactivate trypsin from further reaction. Pipe it repeatedly to manually break the lingering clumps. Fifteen ml of centrifuge tubes are used to pellet cells down.
transfer the cells to the tube. Use a water tube to balance. Centrifuge at 1000 RPM for 5 minutes. The speed of centrifugation also depends on your cell line. Remove supernant and resuspend cells in warm medium. Gentle pipetting will disperse cells to ensure a homogeneous solution of single cells. A fresh flask is used with vented caps. If caps are not vented, cap loosely to allow gas exchange. Old flask can be reused. Fresh 5 ml medium is added. Since we are splitting the cells, half of the resuspended cells are added in each flask.
using a north south east west motion cells are evenly distributed The flasks are kept at 37 degrees centigrade with 5% carbon dioxide in a humidified incubator. The process of cell splitting for suspension cells is similar to the adherent, except it does not require cell removal via trypsin. Remove the media and transfer it to the 15 ml centrifuge tube. After centrifugation, the supernant is removed and the pallet is resuspended in fresh medium. Based on cell count, add additional fresh medium to the flask. This is important to maintain optimal air exchange. Divide half of the resuspended cells into both flasks. Cap the flasks appropriately depending upon whether they are vented or not and return them to the incubator. No. At the end of the work, a login sheet is maintained. Solid waste produced during the work is discarded in a biohazard bag. Neck of the bag is twisted to form a goose neck and is tightly sealed with an adhesive tape. A waste discarding form is filled. This contains all the information of the bag and its contents. The form is then pasted on the bag. The bag is then discarded in a biohazard container, which is then sent for incineration. Liquid waste is neutralized with 10 to 15% of bleach solution. This is kept for 15 to 20 minutes to allow contact time. The liquid waste is then drained in the sink under running water. Gloves are discarded. Lab coat is changed and hands are sanitized before leaving the lab.
So, now you people have uh, basically been introduced to almost all the techniques, including cell counting, cell uh, revival, cryopreservation, trypsinization, and cell passaging of trans uh, trans uh, um, adherent cells and suspended cells as well. And in the end, uh, how to manage waste has also been shown to you. Now, um, you always have to, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Sumi. Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay. So yes, shall I carry on? Is it all okay? Shall yes, everything okay. Okay, okay. So basically, as I have been emphasizing on during the lecture, that cell culture is all about sterility, aseptic techniques, and precautions. You avoid the, uh, avoid the contamination of your cell cultures. Otherwise, because if the cell cultures knowingly or dis -knowing, uh, unknowingly are contaminated, the experiments are not valid then. The results are not valid. And then, of course, you cannot reproduce the results. And um, um, there are many hurdles then to your hypothesis, what you are working on. So... Um, I would like to once again and emphasize on the, the, the techniques, the aseptic techniques that we have to regularly clean and disinfect the work area, just make it a habit. It, it should be like, like you should be robotically doing all these things. You know, you should be robotically disinfecting the area. Nowadays, actually with the Corona crisis, I think we all have in our routine life also been exposed to routine disinfectation, uh, disinfect, um, uh, disinfect, and all these things. So uh, this should also be, um, th this is you, there should be a protocol that you have to follow and uh, you have to regularly clean and disinfect your work area, your equipment. Uh, you have to use fresh lab coat while entering the, the lab, the cell culture lab. The cell culture lab and the routine lab coat though both have to be different. And you, your gloves, um, you have to really disinfect all the bottlenecks all uh, before, it, you know, when you take each and everything out of the fridge, four degrees, and take it to the incubator, you always, always in dis disinfect the caps before opening. Just make it a routine. Um, Bunsen Berber, uh, burner bubble is efficient, but if you don't have that, it's okay. Just follow the aseptic techniques, disinfectant, um, disinfection of the uh, tools and uh, bottles. Everything will be okay. Do not put the, uh, the tips or the bottle uh, caps like downwards. Always put everything base down and upwards. Do not uh, put them uh, turned over because then it, it can trap some, some um, contamination from the surface. Then always maintain your direction while working in the flow foot. If you are left-handed, then have all your equipment that you hold on the left-hand side so that you don't cross over. This is a very big problem. And if you're right-handed, have everything that you have to hold on your right side so that you do not cross-contaminate things and you do not expose the things with your, um, you know, uh, uh, with your hands or anything, you know, or, or the movement of the air. Just be very careful. Always work in one direction. It should be one directional. It should not be sweeping, swapping throughout the hood. Do not touch the bottle openings, clear up the spills and always disinfect if some cell debris falls or if a medium, uh, some medium drops on the surface of the hood or anywhere, immediately clean it, disinfect it and then continue your work. So, now we'll talk uh, we have talked about the techniques. If you have any questions regarding the techniques, uh, you can let me know. <coughs> Hello. 
Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, please. I have question uh, uh, that uh, we are using uh, antibiotics uh, for bacterial uh, contamination. Yes, yes. But uh, what uh, what uh, we will use for uh, fungal infection? Uh, fungal uh, contamination. Yes. Fungal contamination, you know, I told you earlier, canamycin, actinomycin. But the, the biggest problem is this, that with the fungal contamination, because of the fungal spores, it's a very big problem. So avoid contamination, fungal contamination as much as possible. And if it occurs, discard the whole batch of cells that are growing in that particular incubator where the fungal infections occur. Because first of all, if you treat your cells with, the, uh, with strong fungicides, then they will not retain their original uh, physiological characteristics for quite some passages. So you will not have the right results in the experiments. So what I suggest is do not use any antifungal as such, but just be careful and discard anything that has any fungal contamination, clean up the whole incubator, the whole hood if this occurs and start from the beginning. Okay, because of the fungal so spores, because of the fungal spores, you know, it's very difficult to finish them and then, and it's very long-term and it, it won't result in anything good. Okay, ma'am, thank you so much. Yes. Um, there is one question. Dr. Reza would like to know the concentration of pen strip in, in, a, in a medium. Yes. Um, normally, the, the concentration depends on how, what type of solution do you have. Every company has its different solution. I think what I use from Sigma, no, from Gipco, 500 units, 5,000 units. And uh, um, I use uh, five, uh, five ml of pen strip in uh, 500 ml of the medium. I don't exactly remember the concentration because now I'm not in my lab because of the internet problem. Now I'm in some other lab. Otherwise I could have quickly shown you the original concentration of my pen strip. But what I use from Gipco, um, I use 5 ml uh, for 500, mic uh, 500 ml of the medium. I think it's about 5,000 units. Uh, there are no questions. Uh, would you okay. okay, then we can we can carry on. Uh, okay. Now, basically, you must have been thinking all along that the the cell culture and tissue culture, uh, basically, you know, um, how how do um, how do we begin with all these things or how do we understand the idea? So basically this, this idea of tissue culture and cell culture, you know, it's, um, it's basically, um, it's a generic term, which includes the, as I told you in the definition also in vitro cultivation of organs, tissues or cells. So what we do basically is, well, earlier, the scientists have tried in the beginning to grow adult tissue from adult tissues. And so uh, they, they cultivated um, cell culture or tissue culture from adult tissue that was derived from uh, or taken from other animals, living animals or dead animals. And the problem is if we talk about tissue culture, it's a little bit complicated term because a tissue does not consist of a single type of cells because a tissue is a group of uh, highly specialized cells. You know, they could be like a mixture of cells, but it's not necessary that they are one type of cell that could be grown into, um, uh, you know, 
uh, in vitro, they could be cultured into cell culture medium. They have a very, very structured extracellular matrix, very, very strong. That's not easily breakable. And to for the processes of initiation and propagation, adult tissue is very difficult and complicated. And of course, it has a shorter lifespan. Um, so, um, in my lab, we earlier used to, um, we tried to cultivate from uh, these uh, prostate tumor cells from uh, after the operations, the, we, used, we were sent these uh, prostate tumor tissues and uh, we tried to cultivate them, but it was such a uh, tedious process and uh, the, the lifespan of these um, tumor cells, the prostate uh, cells were so, was so, used to be so small that whatever we wanted to do, we just could have done, would have done um, um, in just like, uh, say for example, less than a week which is not an optimal time to set up things and to really let the cells grow, but, but, but they don't really last long. So it's no use. We have to depend on the, uh, we have to think about other types of tissues. And uh, in this regard, when it comes to mind, embryonic tissue is the first thing. Adult tissue, difficult, but if we talk about the embryonic tissues, because you know it has many growth factors and we can really propagate and initiate these cells. And uh, almost all the embryonic cells uh, are very easy to culture. They are different from the adult cells. You really cannot say that they are the normal adult cells because the embryonic cells have their different um, uh, specialization and properties. And they do not automatically in vitro develop into mature adult type cells. The, for example, say for example, we have um, mesodermal cells, they often outgrow epithelial, endocrine or neural cells. New selective media helps cell cultures differentiate into desired tissues. In some cases, serum was inhibitory to growth and encouraged differentiation. And we have uh, a lot of embryonal uh, established cell lines, 3T mouse fibroblasts, lung fibroblasts, et cetera. And of course, we, we, uh, a very common um, uh, cell line that we use is hex cells, human embryonal kidney cells. It's a very, very, we call it a, a normal cell line, but technically it is not a normal cell line. It's an embryonal cell, uh, cell line but they're very easy to propagate and they're very easy to work with. Embryonic stem cells. Taken during the blastocyte stage, they can be grown for many generations. They can be manipulated. They can be um, reintroduced into um, you know, the host and they, a lot of work can be done with these embryonic stem cells. Then the normal tissue. Normal tissue has cultures with finite lifespan, means they have a limited lifespan. They do not have immortal lifespan. They can be dead or they can die at one point or stop growing at one point. Cell cultures begin as stem cells or precursor cells. When precursor cells differentiate, they often stop proliferating because at one point when, when the precursor cells they differentiate into something specific, then they stop growing, they stop dividing. Um, only few exceptions that still proliferate after differentiation are fibrocytes and endothelium cells. Neoplastic tissue. Differentiated cells retain ability to develop, divide and develop. Melanoma, hepatoma, neuroblastoma. And these animal cells can be passaged into syngenic host. Now, uh, these neoplastic tissues are very useful because they, they can be uh, again reintroduced into the host. Uh, they, they can be um, in, introduced into a syngenic host. Syngenic host means the host with identical genes, the tissues with identical genes, or they come from uh, the same genetic background. Um, we have, um, uh, uh, but in, in any case, for, for the syngenic host, we normally use mice. Um, they, we have the, 
of course, when we don't have a natural host like a human being available for these tumors, then we take um, mice. <clears throat> it's a little bit difficult to grow these tissues, but uh, it works and has the same uh, properties and advantages growing all these tissues in. Then we have neoplastic tissue. Neoplastic tissues uh, are differentiated cells they, and they retain their ability to divide. Melanoma, uh, sorry, this is primary cell progression. Now um, we, we, can, we have to really think about how, um, the, we talked about the adult tissues, we talked about the embryonal stem cells, we, we talked about the neoplastic tissues, but we also have to at one point think of primary cell culture progression because there are certain experiments and there are certain methods which require the progression and the growth and you know, culturing of primary cells. So primary cells basically short adaptation period to the cell culture media. Primary cells have exponential growth phase. They have increased, increased confluency, which leads to differentiation. After 20 to 80 generations, senescence sets in. Now, senescence means sensitivity sets in, and uh, they don't really um, remain the same as they are. In rare cases, the cells transform into continuous cell lines, and uh, genetically homogeneous cell lines are obtained by cloning, but normally um, it's it's a short adaptation period and uh, to the cell culture media. And we have to be very, very um, particular about this. Primary cell culture pro uh, progression. Now we have to see if we take the primary cell culture um, from a host and then we want to grow it. Say for example, we uh, seeded at zero week, day one. Uh, 1 million cells. Then after the seeding, first subculture, the growth rate will go up. The second subculture up. Third, after 10 weeks, 12 weeks, 14 weeks, the um, progression will go up and the proliferation is, will also carry on. But at one point after, say for example, um, 14, we uh, 14 weeks, it will start coming down the cells will develop senescence, they will be sensitive and they will die. And sometimes at this point, they can, can be uh, transformed into a continuous immortal cell line, which we can grow, uh, but most of the times it is also possible that they die after 20 weeks. They just uh, stop growing, stop proliferating and they die. In adherent cell cultures. Now, adherent cell cultures, normally they are preferred in a monolayer. Their attachment is very important for, the, for proliferation because if they are not adherent, then they will not grow. They will not divide. If they, uh, they are inhibited from contacting with each other in groups or with the surface they want to grow on or they could grow on, then they will stop dividing and they will just um, become senescence and they will die. Most of the cells, they grow in adherent forms in adherent cultures. And these adherent cultures, um, as I showed you in the video, these adherent cu uh, cultures have to be specifically trypsinized by the enzyme trypsin and they um, have to be properly passaged uh, they have to they have to be detached and uh, massaged. Then we have the suspension cultures, as I showed you in the trypsinizing and the cell massaging video. The adherent cell culture separation and growing, and suspension cell culture. Now these uh, suspension cell cultures are normally they are cells from blood, spleen, and bone, and um, they they just grow. Normally in a suspension, they do not need any surface or their uh, internal contact to uh, grow. They're very easy to harvest and they do not need any trypsin to um, further harvest them or passage them or divide them. We just 
passage them normally by making a pellet and subdividing them into uh, flasks and just adding fresh medium to them. Now, last but not the least, we will talk about the applications. We studied all these techniques. We studied um, how to preserve cells, how to revive them, how to trypsonize them, how to take care of them, how to avoid contamination. But why? Why go through all the trouble? The most important thing is we have we, the drug development systems. They all now in the modern times, they all need in vitro experiments. So vaccine production is very important application of cell culturing, tissue engineering, skin cartilage, stem cells. Then comes a very important thing, but it's not common, 3D cell culture. Uh, maybe uh, some coming uh, in the next, next workshop, which we conduct, I would like to show you the 3D cell culture and how to do it. It is, it is done with a special natri gel uh, and the cells are enclosed and they grow within the matrix. And it's, um, it's a very, um, and it produces a tumor-like environment. And you know, you can study complex environments, tumor environments with this 3D cell culture, but it's not very common at the moment. Further applications in vitro model for tel cell tissue properties, proteins, um, uh, protein um, estimation, Western blot, we need always, we need the cell pellets, uh, DNA, Southern blot, RNA, Northern blot, reverse transcriptase, PCR, we, all, we always need the cells for these people. We these procedures. In vitro model for treatment with substances, effects on cell, cell growth analysis, infiltration assays. How do we do that? We all do this in vitro, um, in vitro with the, with the cell culture uh, techniques that we have learned. Cell marking with imaging agents, membrane receptors, intracellular accumulation, imaging, um, life cell imaging, um, uh, uh, the uptake of drugs, the effect of drugs, and um, labeling of all the of these drugs and um, uh, targeting agents or markers can be done, and we can all study this in vitro. In the experimental sec section, I've already showed you um, methods, basic cell culture, handling of cell culture materials, cell culture flasks, about them, trypsinizing, cell counting, seeding. This is something with microscopy, the normal microscopy I uh, introduced you to, but this is fluorescence microscopy. This is also now commonly used uh, in the cell culture methodologies because you know we label certain drugs or we uh, label certain tumor markers and then we would like to, we label them with fluorescent labels. Then we would like to see how they function or how they're taken up by the cells. And this is, um, then flow cytometry is also a very, very important method. Um, flow cytometry is fluorescent activated cell sorting. It's a single cell in a cell flow. The detector, um, it depends which detector do you want, detector you want to choose. Uh, cell specific parameters are there. The, the size of the cells is also important. The granularity of the, uh, sub, uh, the your suspension is important, and the fluorescence intensity of the cells is then uh, measured by the flow cytometer. When the cell uh, cells one by one pass through the um, the tube, and then the laser hits the cells and it's um, uh, it's diverted, then we uh, know how much uh, fluorescence uh, was produced and um, uh, what is the basically the um, uh, what, how how did our fluorescence marker fluorescent marker you know um, affect the cells did it bind to the cells or uh, was there any effect this is something that flow cytometry could tell us at one point and uh, 
in the end, I would like you all, uh, I would like to thank you all for your attention and uh, patience. And uh, if you have any questions, you can ask. Thank you so much, Dr. Sumla. And it's uh, very informative. And uh, uh, is there any question, Kiran? No, no, no questions. Uh, in the chat, there is no more question. Any participant has any question right now? There is one question. Um, they want to know what is uh, in the media that causes inactivation of the trypsin. Fetal bovine serum. Serum. Um, Shafika Naim would like to know if during cryopreservation she can use media along with the FBS. In cryopreservation, uh, I think there are always, we should not uh, try to develop our own cryopreservation methods or uh, the suspensions. I think it's, um, it is always uh, a said um, constituency and we should uh, stick to that, I think, with DMSO and all that and the FBS. I have never experimented on that. <laughs> I always use what, what is there. I mean, what, what is status, what we should do. I do not experiment with the medium. I have never uh, done that. Excuse me, ma'am. I have a question. Yes. Why we use uh, heat inactivated FBS? Um, uh, actually, because you know, the FBS contains uh, a lot, lot of compounds and it's a mixture of so many things. And we, we normally use, um, the, the medium is always at 37 degrees centigrade. So in order to avoid complications or to the effect of other uh, things that are present in the FPS, and to, of course, there is also one more thing to avoid contamination or growth of other uh, factors or things that are present in the FPS because it's not pure something, it's just a serum, it's a mixture, a big mixture of things which we even do not know. So they technically inactivate it to inactivate a lot of other things that are present in the serum. And so the quality of the, the, the effect of the serum only remains the main thing, but the rest, it becomes dysfunctional. Thank you, ma'am. Go ahead, sir. Um, Tariq Ayub wants to know if you have any idea about where to get 3D cell lines. Um, no, 3D, uh, yes. no, the 3D cell lines we don't get from anywhere. Actually, <clears throat> 3D cell culture is a technique. Um, and um, I wanted to introduce this this time, but I don't think it is possible online. You know, it is a very new technique. Actually, it is, <coughs> excuse me, there is this metri gel, which is available commercially, and we grow the cells on that. And sometimes we clump the cells or the cell pellet into that metri gel and then um, attach it to the animal host or uh, to leave it in a or or we leave it in the in the you know uh, cell culture wells plates so it um, it's you you can't find the cell types you can grow any cell type in 3d culture but you have to have the specific equipment that's uh, specially which has this which is called a matri a matri gel it's a matrix it's a gel matrix like it's, it's something like you can say, it's like a thin membrane made up of a matrix, um, which, uh, which is identical to the 
tissue matrix. And then the cells start growing entrapped into that uh, cell, into that matrix, that, which is artificial and they cannot escape out of that. And then you have a tumor-like environment. So you have to grow the cells in a specific membrane to get this 3D cell culture. We would also like to know where in Pakistan we have this facility. I don't think you have in Pakistan because in Pakistan, ICCBS is the, is the most advanced thing. I, I personally don't know any place. I mean, we can look if some institutes have it probably, but um, I personally think it's not very common. It's even not very common here. But um, like I perform cell invasion experiments and it's sort of a, a 3D atmosphere in a special uh, well, which is coated with the membrane and then we grow the cells on that. And then we, we see if the cells uh, metastase through this uh, membrane. So, but it's very expensive and uh, not a common technique. Thank you, Dr. Samla. And uh, uh, since we have no more questions right now, and so we will end the workshop here. And uh, okay. I would like to thank you for uh, uh, giving so much time and lots of knowledge. And uh, at the same time, I would uh, request all the participants to join again uh, tomorrow for the second day of uh, uh, this workshop. And uh, Dr. Alex will be the so resource person. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, all of you, for being here, for attending this workshop. And I hope uh, um, I was of... Um, um, I could um, help you people with some things and your questions have been answered and um, um, I did what was in my capacity to uh, teach you in a very simple way. So let's hope it's all useful to you and um, you've learned something. Thank you so much and uh, we'll see all the participants tomorrow inshallah okay okay then have a nice day all of you thanks for joining thank you thank you thank you very much dr sumla thank you thank you Allah. bye Allah. 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 Allah.